pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Stephen Walbach. I met Stephen five years ago or six years ago in Ferellon Pass, deep in the North District. Uh, I've been hoping to get him to speak ever since. So uh, Dr. Walbach is a fellow Bookout Chair for Structural Geology at the Jackson School of Geosciences, Senior Research Scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas, Austin. He leads the Fracture and Structural Diagenesis programs. His interests include, and are not limited to, geothermal and unconventional resource and fractured reservoirs, fracture pattern evolution, and field core and microstructural field inclusion cathode luminescence applications for structural geology and sedimentary petrology. Dr. Lawbach supervises grad students in research at the Jackson School of Geosciences. He has received many awards. I'm not gonna list them all because we wanna hear from him. Uh, he edits a number of scientific journals and has served on many scientific boards. He received his Bachelor of Science in Geology from Tufts University in Massachusetts and his University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lobach. Well, thank you all for coming out to uh, hear about fractures. This is definitely not one of the more sexy geoscience topics out there. And I noticed that uh, we have some esteemed guests in the Zoom world here. So um, Randy and Larry and Steph, just to forgive the uh, unavoidable jumps in logic that are going to occur <laughs> next few minutes. <laughs> I try to make this uh, presentation so that it is uh, user friendly to non geologists as well as experts. And so I just want to start out by saying, though, that there are some completely open access journal papers uh, listed here that if anybody's interested in the nitty gritty, gory details, I'd be happy to provide those to you. And I also want to uh, state at the outset that a lot of the work that's going on in the Tetons is by some of my PhD students, Stephanie Forster, who's online, I think, and Kiki Wang. Their work is supported by uh, the Office of Science at DOE and overall by an industry consortium called the Fracture Research and Application Consortium. And uh, we're incredibly grateful to Grand Teton National Park uh, for permission to work in the park and for sampling uh, permits over several years, and to Liz Barrett for f facilitating that permitting process, and Diane Wheeler over in the Jedediah Smith Wilderness for helping us there. And I also want to thank uh, Anne, Ava, Isabel Hayden for their photography, field support, and especially the forbearance over the years. <laughs> um, so why should anybody care about fractures? So this is a picture of water gushing from a fracture in granite up at Snowdrift Lake in the Tetons. And it shows that fractures are the principal way that fluids flow through otherwise low permeability rock. And so understanding fractures is incredibly important for many practical applications, including fractured oil and gas reservoirs, unconventional reservoirs, also underground fluid storage, and geothermal energy extraction, which I'll expand on a little bit today. And uh, for those of you who don't have an industry background, I know that there are some that do in the audience, but the, when we're interested in fractures, most of our data comes from the subsurface. Most of the most reliable data comes from the subsurface where we have cores and well bores where we can image fractures or sample them. But we also, in understanding fractures, make a lot of use of outcrops as analogs for the subsurface. And I think after this talk, you'll understand why. And so the, our main reason for working on the Flathead Sandstone is that it is a, an analog that we think or a guide to what fractures in the deep subsurface might look like. So one of the themes in the bizarre part of the story here is telling different fracture patterns apart. And so the question is, well, why would we even want to try and tell a couple of different fractures apart from each other. And the reason why is because the aggregate 
of fractures in rocks, the patterns, their spacing and arrangement and numbers, and how they're interconnected are really the vital things that control fluid flow. So in this uh, set of uh, field photos from some flathead outcrops, you can see an interconnected fracture network here that might lead to more pervasive flow. Whereas here we have a bunch of fractures that are all uh, huddled close together to each other in a kind of a cluster. And that might be a situation that would lead to uh, more concentrated flow. And so those are the kinds of things we want to know about the fracture in aggregate. And I thought it might be useful to, as a uh, Jackson Hole uh, way of looking at things here to, to use an analogy. We could think of these different patterns as like different kinds of mammals. They're all made of the same things that go into mammals, you know, the same arms and legs and eyes and everything, but they're different sizes and different shapes and they have different life habits. And it makes a big difference which one of them you encounter. For example, encountering a pika might be a different experience from encountering a moose or a bear. And so if you think about patterns, what we're trying to get at is to try and understand what these animals are. So that's an, an analogy. And I'm now going to stretch this analogy horribly. But so the left-hand side here, this is a block diagram showing a bunch of fractures in some layer drop with some well bores going through it. And you can see the problem immediately is sampling the fractures with well bores. We don't get the pattern. We just get one fracture or maybe no fractures. So the problem is we have to deduce the patterns from the samples of individual fractures. And so that's like telling animals apart using their footprints. Oops, so far, so good. That should be easy, right? Well, the problem is that when we look at fractures, we see that a wide range of processes can cause fractures. And the picture on the left is some fracture in concrete that might have been caused by a badly designed foundation. The fractures on the right from up, up on uh, Prospector's Peak might have been caused by tectonic mountain building. But the fractures look alike, right? Fracture in that avalanche that just went down Spring Gulch Road probably looked like these things too. And so the problem with these fractures looking alike is that even though we're trying to tell the animals from the footprints, all the footprints look alike. It's as if the bears had pica feet or something. <laughs> and so you, you have a, a serious problem. And so the way we, the way the field has dealt with trying to understand fractures is using fracture mechanics. These are some equations from linear elastic fracture mechanics. The diagram on the right is showing a pattern of fractures in a, in a model where we've got fixed boundary conditions and certain kind of uh, uh, boundary conditions that are causing the fractures to grow. But the, and so this is a very powerful set of tools for understanding how fracture patterns evolve and what causes different kinds of fracture patterns. It is the go-to 98% of what goes on in fracture research is based on fracture mechanics. But there's a fundamental problem with fracture mechanics. It doesn't care anything about what the fractures look, really look like inside. It treats them all as identical. So like that diagram up, up on the right there, they all, all the fractures have the same simple shapes. So as far as fracture mechanics go, the, the bears and the moose all still have pica feet. They don't care. So we're, we're missing the evidence in these patterns in the individual fractures coming from fracture mechanics to tell the patterns apart. And the positive side of that is we can ignore all these fracture mechanics equations. We don't have to go into them. But the problem is that we still don't know how to tell different fractures apart. So we want to know how the fractures form so that we can predict the patterns from samples. We know that different processes can lead to different patterns, but the, the end result fractures end up looking alike. And that phenomena is called equifinality. So if you don't get anything else out of this tonight's lecture, you get this really cool new word that you can use in Wordle or something like that. Uh, equifinality is a situation where many different processes lead to the same end result. And it's the, the bane of people working on fractures. It's the reason why so many people go into fracture research because it's an important field and then immediately switch to another field as soon as they figure out what the problems are. So 
what we're going to try to do is solve the problem of equifinality. And let's start out with some required reading for uh, structural geology students who are interested in fractures. In the canon, everybody needs to read the redheaded leak because this is the best explication of how to deal with the problem of, of simple problems. And in the redheaded leak, Holmes and Watson are faced with some very strange behavior that all has to do with people with bright red hair. And after the, the situation is explained by Holmes to Watson, uh, Holmes turns to Watson, asks him, what do you, what do you make of that? And Watson says, uh, I make nothing of it, frankly. It is a most mysterious business. And, and Holmes says, as a rule, the more bizarre a thing is, the less mysterious it proves to be. It's your commonplace featureless crimes which are really puzzling, just as a commonplace face is the most difficult to identify. And so our mission is to uh, take on these featureless crimes and to find out their secrets, we need to discover something bizarre about them. So by the end of this, we'll have some bizarre stuff to show you. So this is the outline of what, say what a fracture is, how do you make uh, sand into a sandstone? I'll introduce the flathead sandstone, the main character. We'll take a brief uh, superficial tour of some of the outcrops of this iconic rock in the Tetons, and then talk about why the flathead and its sisters, which extend all across North America, and uh, why that matters for geothermal energy. I'll introduce a little bit about what geothermal everywhere is and what its challenges are, and then talk about how to tell the fractures apart. And I hope the outcome of this, there's a lot of information in here, but that the next time you go out in the Tetons, you'll look at these rocks with new eyes. And so let's start with the, with the what are fractures? Well, fractures are easy. They're just another word for crack. Here are three examples of fractures that have had an opening displacement. And what's different about them is the mineral deposits in them. So these may be some familiar terms to some of you. Fractures that are completely filled are often called veins. Ones that have nothing in them are called joints. And the most common type in the subsurface are actually ones that are mixed. They've got some fill and then some places that are not so filled. And so uh, that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about, some opening mode fractures. This picture on the right is a picture of what fractures look like in a nice big outcrop. And I'll show a lot of little diagrams like this one on the right which are nothing more than trace maps that are representing fracture patterns like these. So they're just ways of representing how the fractures are arranged. What about what makes sand into sandstone? Well, really it just take sand grains and put some naturally occurring cement in it. And it turns out that time in the oven or exposure to heat is the important thing for that. So there's some sand and some sandstone, but to simplify that into a diagram, you have some grains, you have some pore space and eventually cement fills that in. Well, believe it or not, for many years up until the late 1990s, how that cement got into sandstone was a huge controversial topic that nobody could agree on. And for the chemists in the audience, and I know there's at least one, the, the question the, is, well, you've got to, to put quartz cement into the sandstone, you need to dissolve silica somewhere, you need to transport it, and you need to precipitate it. And there was a huge amount of work on how do you dissolve this stuff and how do you transport it? In, and none of that research led to any kind of understanding of how you could predict how much cement was in the sandstone. And it was these guys, Rob Lander and Linda Bennell in the late 1990s who had the insight to think, well, what if the rate limiting step is the precipitation step and we could ignore everything else? And using that insight, they were able to build a very successful business predicting sandstone reservoir quality and reservoirs. And so here you see a simulation of that green stuff, which is the quartz cement, gradually gr growing and filling in the pore space in this, in this aggregate of sand grains. And what they discovered was that the thermal history, the time in the oven, the surface area, which is maybe represented by the grain size here, and the crystallography of quartz, like those beautiful crystals that you see in some rock shops are what controls the accumulation of quartz cement. And I'm going into this in a little bit of detail because this was a this was a, really a masterful insight into how sandstone diagenesis works. The same process though plays a role in understanding how fractures work. 
And that was an unexpected consequence of that. So let's have a field trip now. And we'll start with uh, Dave Love's famous 1972 block diagram of the Teton Range. Probably to this audience, I don't need to say any more, but as uh, some of you may need to be reminded, the Teton block is a normal fault block with a big Teton normal fault on the east side uh, shown here with a big block of crystalline rocks with a layer of Paleozoic sedimentary rocks on top of it, tilted off towards the Idaho side. And that's those Paleozoic rocks there are in blue. What some people don't realize is that inside the range, there are some enormous reverse faults that are older than the Teton fault that lift up the eastern part of the crystalline rocks, the Grand and the Mount Moran and everything. And that's why when you look at the Tetons from the Idaho side, you see this sort of level ground with all the peaks sticking up in it because the peaks are on the upthrown side of the reverse faults that are in the range. And so that's the geologic context of the field trip. And what we're, this is a strat column here. So what we're gonna be looking at then is the Flathead Sandstone, which is the lowest unit in this stack of Paleozoic sandstones. It's something in the range of 520 million years old when it was deposited on top of a, 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 an erosional surface on top of much older crystalline basement rocks. So the field trip is going to go from Mount Moran down to Sheep Steps and Burren Creek and then Kit Lake, and then we'll end up at Teton Pass. And so the, the cool thing that you can see on Mount Moran, even from anywhere in the valley, is the unconformity on the, on the top of the, of the peak. And so you see the, the gneisses and the dike cutting through the, the older crystalline rocks, and then that red line is marking the base of the flathead. And so the very top of that flat surface on the top of Mount Moran is a little bit of a layer of, the, of this Cambrian sandstone that's been left behind up there as an erosional surface. And I can't really claim to have gone there, but um, Julia and Ann went up there to do some geological uh, field support for me. And this is what the outcrop of the Flathead sandstone on the top of Mount Moran looks like. It's loaded with fractures, should say great, right? Except these are all mostly due to frost heave. And so they're actually very hard for us to work with. And so luckily we don't have to go up there and do a pavement map. Sorry, Steph, if you're out still online there. <laughs> That's what the outcrop looks like. Um, there are some better places, easier places anyway, to see the unconformity, for example, in the near Sunset Lake with the granite with the flathead on top of it or over near Green Lakes, where you can see a little bit of topography on the unconformity and some nice conglomerates. Uh, on this somewhat subdued, rugged topography at the base of the flathead. So now let's go look at some of the cool locations for, for fractures. So this is a map of the range. There's the, the Teton Normal Fault, and here are the reverse faults in the range. And this, these pink colors are the outcrops of the flathead sandstone. So this block is blown up here, and you can see these layers of uh, flathead sandstone dipping off towards Idaho. So the first stop is sheep steps. And this is what it looks like from um, uh, one side of uh, Alaska Basin looking across at the uh, sheep steps locality. And there's the path, the uh, Teton Crest Trail winding its way up to the Mount Meek Pass. And you can see all the Paleozoic rocks dipping gently off to the east. So not a very structurally complicated area. And when you look at the fracture patterns in cross section or plan view here, you can see that the fractures have a very fairly simple pattern. They more or less look like that. So when you go to these outcrops and look at them, you'll see some other stuff going on. You need to be able to look through that. So I've got them annotated here. The red lines are the fractures that we're interested in, the older fractures, but they're also glacial striations and these beautiful curved uh, uh, glacial chattermark fractures, which are spectacularly uh, um, presented there, but really only of interest to you glacial geomorphologists probably. If you go just over in the next valley to Roaring Creek, there's some beautiful examples of the simple old fractures, very similar to sheep steps in fact, but here we have these little fractures coming off the edge to fracture people. These are super cool things called wing cracks. And they indicate that the older fractures have been sheared, they've been slipped um, by some later event. And you can also see there's some glacial striations there up underneath the zoom controls. <clears throat> 
if we go to Kit Lake now, you should see that Kit Lake is now right next to the Buck Mountain Fault Zone. And if you have a chance to climb up to the end of the, the uh, Avalanche Divide Trail, the farthest end of the south fork of the Cascade, south fork of Cascade Canyon, you can get to these outcrops. And they are, from a structural point of view, among the best in the Rockies. And so let's, uh, so we're looking into Avalanche Canyon at Snowdrift Lake at the South Teton here. And when you take a closer look uh, at that pass there, you can see that there are numerous faults of the Buck Mountain Reverse Fault, which are pus pushing these crystalline rocks up over the top of the sedimentary rocks that are in the side. And I just annotated this, make it a little bit clearer. Those are all places where you see different uh, exposures of flathead sandstone repeated by faults, where the, the faults have stacked flathead sandstone up on top of each other. And right under the, the cursor there is a little outcrop. And I noticed that Randy Merritt was in the audience. That's the outcrop when we first went to this place in 2003, which was covered with snow, that Randy deduced must have a fault in it, even though we couldn't see it. And so a couple of years ago when the snow was down, we went there and by gosh, you know, there's beautiful fault exposed there. But in any case, when you're at the bottom of the stack near Kit Lake, the fractures look kind of like uh, over at Sheep Steps. But as you go up towards the faults, you see these spectacular folds where the flatheads has been twisted up as it's been sheared by the faults. And you can even find places where the flathead sandstone is completely upside down as in these pictures where it's just twisted around and then sheared out and then has crystalline rock plastered over the top of it. And if you look across Kit Lake to the south toward Vail Peak Claw, you can see all these faults well exposed. And if you go up on the claw, up on that spot there, south of Kit Lake, you can see beautiful examples of um, two sets of fractures in these bedding plane, ex steeply dipping bedding plane exposures of the flathead. And then finally, the easiest outcrop of all the, the uh, flathead to get to the big exposures along, high, uh, along the uh, road up to Teton Pass. And these, these are pretty similar to the, what you might see at Sheep Steps, although there's some differences. But I think this is a good point to pause and say, well, what have we learned from this little expedition through the fractures in the flathead at this point? We're right on schedule here. Um, so what we've seen is that there are a range of fracture patterns. Some of them are interconnected and complicated. Some of them are clustered. Some of them are simple. There's a variety of things. They might be pretty interesting analogs to the subsurface. Unfortunately, so far, we haven't seen any evidence of how to tell these fractures apart. These could have been made by the, the Teton Normal Fault, by the Buck Mountain Fault, by glacial activity, by modern weather. Who knows? So what the uh, technical term for this kind of fracture is garden variety fracture, right? <laughs> um, which means, you know, you just shake your head and go and look at some different fractures if that's your only choice. There are some other things so that we can learn by looking at the outcrops in um, at Teton Pass. You look at this outcrop of the, the flathead and what this difference in erosion that you can see here is a reflection of the fact that as you go up in the outcrop from older rocks to younger rocks, the rocks are getting finer grained. They're going from sandstones to siltstones to main shaley rocks at the top. And that is a sign that these rocks were being deposited while sea level was rising. And in fact, if you look at a paleogeographic map of, of uh, the Cambrian time, so you can see the faint outline of states in here on the the paleo continent of Laurentia, where the equator in those days was like this and north is in that direction. And that's where the future Tetons are gonna be. The flathead was in a shallow sea that was gradually rising and submerging Laurentia. And eventually it sank the whole thing. And so that was what was going on in the Paleozoic. But what that means is that there are lots of sandstones all across North America that are correlative with each other. And if you look at this old uh, stratigraphic diagram from an old Wyoming Geological Society guidebook, um, 
those of you who are not uh, stratigraphers may have looked at things like this and said, what is wrong with these guys? They've got the flathead sandstone doing all this wonky stuff. Why did they draft it that way? These are diagrams showing age versus different locations. And if this uh, uh, zoom bar wasn't up here, you would see that this thing here is Western Wyoming where we are, and these are other places in Wyoming. And what the diagram is telling you is that the flathead sandstone in different places is slightly different ages. And the reason for that is because as the sea level rose, where the shallow marine sandstones were ended up creeping up onto the continent. And so by the time you get to Saskatchewan, you're in, uh, they've changed the formation name there, it's called the Deadwood, but it's the same layer of sandstone, just slightly transgressive in its age. And so what that means is that across Laurentia, the bottom layer of the sedimentary column is made up of these shallow marine sandstones. They have different names in different places and slightly different ages, but they're really more or less to a structural geologist, sorry for the stratigraphist thing audience, they're more or less the same thing, right? So down the Grand Canyon, the Tapetes in Texas, the Hickory, up in Saskatchewan, the Deadwood, throughout most of the mid-continent in the Eastern US, it's called the Potsdam. Over in Northwestern Scotland, which is really part of North America, it's called the Arable. And so we can look at all these sandstones and see a huge amount of similarities. And that's important because now we're going to talk a little bit about geothermal. In upstate New York at the Kubo site and in southern Saskatchewan at the deep site, these sandstones are being exploited for geothermal energy, or at least the people who are drilling the wells there hope they will be. And so the flathead sandstone as an outcrop has these closely related sisters all across North America that you can look, some of which you can look at an outcrop to understand what's going on in, the, in these deeper formations. And so just to take a look at the, the Cornell University Borehole Observatory, the Kubo site in Ithaca, New York, the diagram on the right shows what they're hoping to do. They've already drilled one well down to the Potsdam. The idea is to drill a pair of wells, put cold water down one well, have it flow through the rock and heat up and come back up the other well. And then they're gonna heat the whole campus with the, this heat. And yeah, right, that's the hope. And in the deep site in Southern Saskatchewan, this apparently is a, it's a private venture. It's apparently a very successful attempt to tap the Deadwood formation in a similar way to get electricity. So, is the flathead outcrop a good analog to understand any fractures that might be in these? Well, so let's take a step back and say, well, what are we talking about with geothermal everywhere? Um, and what is geothermal? So geothermal is just energy that's thermal energy, heat that's stored in the Earth's crust. And it comes from convection and conduction from the crust and the mantle, radioactive decay of elements and so forth. And there are really two kinds. There are conventional and unconventional uh, geothermal. But what you can, and depending on how hot the, the uh, resource is, you can do different things with it. So that's what this thermometer shows. If you've got really hot stuff in your reservoir, you can generate electricity. If you've got fairly cool things, like over at Iron Rock by the Snake River Bridge, you can heat your house in the wintertime with a simple geothermal heat pump. So uh, what people mean when they say geothermal any, everywhere though, is not just heating your house, but actually getting some energy that would help with the energy mix. And a lot of people are surprised to learn that the largest installed resource base for geothermal, what country is that? New Zealand, Iceland? It's the United States. United States is by far the largest installed geothermal capacity uh, of any, and there it is. It's the biggest inter, and, that, and there's a reason for that. But the other side of the coin is when you look at how much geothermal is of the total US resource pie, it's so small that it usually is too small to show on charts. So there's a pie chart showing the geothermal part. So the aim is to somehow make the pie bigger. So the high grade resources, they're all the Rocky Mountain and West. The map on the right shows uh, temperatures at six and a half kilometers and that's hot. You're near subduction zones, active faults, volcanoes, 
and uh, people around here know what hot geothermal looks like. Uh, so there's Yellowstone with water boiling at the surface. So that's conventional geothermal. If you've got that, you're good to go. The trouble is that most of the United States is crustily much, much cooler. And so you can't do that. So geothermal everywhere is, is right now in the Eastern US is like geothermal nowhere. There's no geothermal there now. The idea though, is if you drill deep enough and if you can somehow circulate water through these rocks, then you could make geothermal energy. And the deepest rock in the sedimentary sequence is the Flathead, Potsdam, Deadwood equivalent. So it's a prime target for figuring out how this geothermal works. What you need to have is permeability in the rock because you have two wells, remember, and you're gonna try and circulate through the rock in between them to get the cold water to heat up and go back up. And so uh, here's a diagram from the Cubo site showing what's needed. So you need high flow rates, but you need a fast, effective heat exchange. So no fast pathways. You can't just put a pipe from one well and up the other because then the pipe would eventually cool off and it wouldn't work. So you need sort of the, 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 uh, the ideal mixture of heat flow exchange and that the key there is the presence of the right kinds of fractures. So what do we need? Well, we need core data. We need to understand core data by looking at outcrop analogs, by refining our models for how we understand the subsurface or using our outcrop analogs better. But eventually somehow we need to get an idea of what the fracture patterns are in the subsurface. And then we can do modeling of heat flow, uh, permeability through the rock, heat exchange and so forth to figure out how uh, economic our uh, potential geothermal system is. And so this, uh, the, unfortunately behind the Zoom things up there, it has the title of this, which is the title of a, a master's student named Nina Habel. And then the next three slides are from her master's thesis. It was completed in 2022. And what she, what she did was she did some fracture mapping, even though she wasn't a geologist, she learned how to do it. Um, she did some fracture geomechanical modeling to simulate different kinds of fracture patterns. And then she took the fracture patterns and put them into a fluid flow and heat exchange simulator and looked at how the different fracture patterns affected permeability and heat exchange and compared the effects of the different patterns on all these uh, permeability heat exchange effects. But more than that, since she was in a, in a program at UT, which is called the Energy and Earth, Science, Earth Resources Program, you have to combine engineering, geology, and economics to get your degree. And so she also took that information, and that says fracture effects there above subsurface parameters on the top, and put that into a holistic economic simulator scenario where she looked at um, everything that had to do with the economics of uh, geothermal in a particular place. It was Tompkins, Camp, Tompkins County, which is where Ithaca, New York is looking at the uh, economic viability of um, It doesn't, doesn't look like it wants me to do that. But so the, um, and so she did this economic analysis and, and got it eventually down to, you know, where's the money, you know, how effective is this? And it was done in terms of something called the levelized cost of electricity based on the cost of electricity in Tompkins County. And without going into detail on this uh, diagram, what you can see here is that there are different patterns the different patterns resulted in different permeability. And the, the bottom line was that the permeability was the driver of the economics. And so for some patterns, you have a dramatically different levelized cost of electricity. Some of these would be economic for electricity generation, and some of them would not be. So this is the kind of analysis that you need to do. So if somebody's trying to sell you a prospect on geothermal, you say, well, what kind of fracture patterns did you put in there? And how did you simulate the porosity of the material? It might shut them up. <laughs> um, so now, um, geez, I'm running really fast here. So you're going to have a lot of time to ask questions. Um, so we can take our time here because despite that, I've only taken half an hour. So far. Could you go back and explain that diagram a bit more? This diagram? Uh, 
I can try. <laughs> uh, these things here are the different fracture patterns that were simulated. This is the levelized cost of electricity. So the uh, because the because and so these boxes move around depending on what the permeability is. So if they if they have one kind of permeability, they're higher, and so you've got a higher cost of electricity. And it, for other ones, you have lower costs. These things about quartz and some quartz cement and open and so forth is something I'm not actually going to talk about. But one of the things she looked at um, is, as you'll see in the next set of slides, that when just like in sandstones, when natural fractures form in the earth, they are also subject to the quartz cement filling them in. And so you think, well, great, you know, you fill in the fractures, and then what good are they, right? But as I'll show you, they can, even though you can practically fill in the complete sandstone with cement, the fractures can stay open. They have a kind of a, a unnatural ability to resist filling in, which I'll explain in a sec. So she looked at the different amounts of quartz cement in these different fracture patterns. And so as you add quartz cement, the connectivity of the fracture patterns changes. And this is not something that's normally taken into account in fracture pattern analysis. And I'm going a little bit off script here, but if you want to learn more about it, my student Stephanie Forstner published a paper just last year where she explains how you can take this into account systematically. And I'm sure she'd love everybody to go and download her open access paper because it's currently number one in downloads of the journal Structural Geology. And all you have to do to game the system and impress our dean is for every one of you to go download it. <laughs> <laughs> right, Stephanie? Okay. Um, so how do we tell different fracture patterns apart? You know, this is really the, the, the gist of the problem. This is where fractures need to become bizarre. So, so far, we know that there are fractures down there, but we really can't tell anything about them. We don't know which of those patterns to put in. So even though we know that different patterns lead to different economics, we actually don't have any good idea of which pattern to put in. The folks at Cornell are in that position right now. They've drilled a well. They have a couple of dozen one-inch diameter plugs of the sandstone, and they're going to try and figure out, with our help, what kind of fracture pattern they have to put into their simulation and figure out what to do next. And so we need to figure out how you do that, right? So this is a start on trying to figure out how to tell fractures apart. And the answer to this is that these seemingly garden variety fractures, when you look at them very closely, have bizarre stuff in them that are very, very information rich. They're like tree rings or uh, Encyclopedia Britannica is we haven't really figured out how to read these structures completely, but that's what we're going to talk about now. So if we go to um, Prospector's Peak and look at a typical outcrop of flathead sandstone, and then we're going to zoom in and look carefully at what we see there. And here we have a chunk of rock. This is actually not Potsdam, but, but it exemplifies this phenomena really well. Here we have a fracture surface that has no mineralization on it, it's barren, whereas this one has a veneer of tiny quartz crystals on it. And you say, well, I don't really believe that. You know, that just looks like two different colored outcrops there, or something like that. But if you look at these things a little bit more closely, maybe you can convince yourself that there are actually little crystals on there. And when you're in the outcrop, when you're going to look at the flathead the next time, you need to look for the, on a bright sunny day, look for the coherent reflections, the sharp sparkle that these faces give off. That's really the only hint that you can have an outcrop that's circled there, the sparkle on those things. But if you look at those sparkly surfaces with a powerful electron microscope, you might see something that looks like that. Tiny little quartz crystal growing on the fracture surface. Well, it turns out that these kinds of features are incredibly common. And here's a fracture, it's actually from Northeastern Mexico. And you can see that open gap there is the open fracture. And along the wall of this fracture, um, you can see a, a thin veneer of quartz, but there's something else that you can see in this picture. There are some places here where there are these 
white bands that go across, sort of thick, extra thick wads of quartz. So thin veneers of quartz that you have an electron microscope to even see, and then suddenly some things you can see just from a distance, a thick wad of quartz. And as a structural geologist, I noticed those way back in the 1980s and published a paper about it, didn't think anything of it. Got a little bit of quartz here and a lot of quartz there. What's the big deal? Many, many years later, my friend, friends Rob and Linda showed up. We were going to collaborate. And Rob said, I work on quartz cement. And I said, I've got some quartz cement. And I showed him some pictures of these. And he took one look at it and his face fell. And he said, those cannot be. Those cannot be. And if you think back to the model that we had of how quartz cement accumulates in sandstone, you can see why he said that. You know, you have crystallography, you've got thermal history, you've got quartz accumulating in uniform amounts, more or less. And to have these very thin veneers of quartz with a sudden wad of quartz in the middle, it just didn't compute. And this is what we're talking about when you look at it on the SEM scale, that's a 200 micron bar scale. So there's the fracture walls. There's a little microfracture that's the blue here is quartz. This is part of a quartz grain, that's part of a quartz grain. And there's one of these thick wads like that of quartz in, in the fracture. So those, these are strange. To the sandstone diagenesis, people like Rob and Linda, they said, well, these, these shouldn't exist. Well, can we make anything out of these things? Well, it turns out if you look very closely at them, they are pretty interesting features. One of the things that we do know now, thanks to Stephanie Forstner's work, though, is that the flathead sandstone has these features in them. So these are SEMCL images of flathead sandstone. Here's some quartz grains, quartz grains. This green here is port porosity. And the blue is a veneer, or one of these rinds of quartz along the fracture wall. Oops. And if you look over here, this is an, an example from Kit Lake. You can see the blue is porosity. There are places where you have rinds, and then there are places where there are little quartz bridges there. So the same phenomenon in the flathead. But so to make a long story, these are the answer to what is bizarre in the flathead, these bridges. So the rhymes and the bridges, the abrupt thick deposits, and I'll show you in a second, the complex internal textures are what makes these features bizarre. So we'll take a closer look at this example. This is actually from a tight gas sandstone in East Texas from about almost 10,000 feet. And so on the left, you have a fracture. Um, I get the schematic out of the way. And then the right-hand image is just that part blown up. And then we'll zoom in on that particular bridge up there. And on the right, you have a, a scanning electron microscope, cathode luminescence, panchromatic image with some mapping on top of it. And what you can see there without further ado is that there's a lot of complexity. This is very different from what fracture mechanics gives us, which is just a gap which might be filled in or not, right? So in, compared to the simple uh, all, all you know, bears and moose and everything all have pica feet or, you know, they, these are different. You can tell this one from some other one because all these patterns like tree rings are very different. So we've solved, in a sense, the problem of differentiating these fractures. And what's more is that these features, if you look closely at them, it will just zoom in on the right-hand part of that. I think you can see here some cross-cutting relationships where that is cutting across that guy. This funny thing looks like a bow tie is cutting across that guy. This purple one has been sliced across by that. So this is structural mapping on the sort of the 0.2 millimeter scale of looking at classic cross-cutting relationships of these, what are essentially a whole bunch of different quartz deposits within the fractures. And interestingly enough, in the middle of these bow tie-like features like that one there, along those green lines, if you look at that with transmitted light, you can see there are tiny cavities, which are full of fluids, salts and, um, gases and water called fluid inclusions, which can be analyzed to figure out the salinity and the temperature of the water at the time the fluids were trapped. 
And, and so using the cross-cutting relationships between these deposits and the fluid inclusions, you can look at a temperature history of the fracture through time and a salinity history. These all had constant salinity, but the temperature varied quite a lot. Go back to the previous slide. What exactly is color showing? I'll show you in a second. That's a good question. The question is, what are the colors showing? The colors there are basically map units. So they're the, if you were actually able to see, you would be able to see the cross-cutting relationships and you can make these images in color, but the, the color differentiation there is like separating different units that you could map by the cross-cutting relationships. And this diagram here shows the, how those features arise and what the mapping is based on. So we've got three quartz grains, the, the double pointed arrow shows the C crystallographic axis of the quartz crystals that's inside the quartz grain. And the fracture is just repeatedly cracking and then quartz cement is accumulating in the fractures. And you can see that you're making these little funny bow tie features, just exactly like you see in the map pattern here. So this is, this is just mapping the textures that we see and saying, these guys go together, these guys go together, these guys go together. And this is a, re a reconstruction at a constant temperature of just quartz grains cracking, simulating quartz accumulation. And so you can see from this model that we've reproduced the thin rinds and we've also reproduced the bridges. And I have to say that Rob Lander, uh, after he said that can't be, went away and a week later he came back and he said, problem solved, it all fits in with my model after all. It's not, not a problem. And it turns out these things are exactly understandable in terms of the same model that explains quartz sandstone processes. And um, the reason that there's a difference is because by continuously fracturing the sandstone and then letting the quartz grow across, we're constantly making new surface area. In the regular old sandstone, you start out with a certain surface area governed by the grain size and you just cover quartz cement. Here, um, uh, you, these are all the fast, the phenomena that govern this quartz accumulation, but these bridges are really formed by one fundamental phenomenon. If you look at the at a given temperature, the rate of accumulation on any one of these faces, on a fracture face, that's what non-euhedral means, and, a, and, and a, these um, faceted faces, the difference between the freshly broken surface and the crystal faceted face is about 60 times faster. So what that means is that if you go back to this guy, um, that every time that fracture, you get it to run again. Um, every time that grain cracks, you're at the fast growth rate. But as soon as the crystals become faceted, they go to the slow growth rate. And so in a kind of a competition between fracture opening and quartz accumulation, there are lots of conditions where the, the quartz can just never keep up. And it turns out that these fractures can stay open for tens of millions of years at high temperature and not be sealed. Uh, th in this diagram here, these are pores, these are quartz grains, these are feldspar grains. The red and the blue are, um, let's see if I can get this to play again. The red and the blue are all quartz cement the red is accumulating at the fast rate and the blue is accumulating at the slow rate. So you see that the, in the pores, you quickly go from the fast to the slow rate and then the whole rate slows down, at least in porosity. In the fracture, where the fracture, the cement doesn't span across, it goes to the slow rate and it can never catch up. But where you just repeatedly crack the material and let quartz accumulate, then it can always keep up. You know, it doesn't always keep up, but it can keep up for a long ways. Some of these fractures can have hundreds of little tiny opening increments. And so the temperature is important. The difference between the fracture surface and the faceted crystal rate, the fracture opening rate, obviously, the opening increment size. And there are some things about the size of the grains that are cut and whether they're feldspar or not. Or not. But essentially, we understand at this point what controls these phenomena. And so 
what that means is we can go to a weird structure like this. This is one fracture wall, another fracture wall in East Texas. There's a diagram of it, one of these long skinny bridges. And if you look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of this, you can see the how this opening history of a fracture um, at a specific temperature is creating this, what, I mean, to a, is, is a really weird looking structure, right? I mean, the, it's like, well, how could nature do something like that? Yeah, this is uh, probably pretty common everywhere in the subsurface, not just in sandstones with other mineral systems. And so this diagram is showing fast, which is the red, the hot colors, and then the bluer colors are the slow opening rate. And what you can see, and this is the temperature history of it, and this is the time history of this fracture opening history. And you can see that this fracture opening history took more than 40 million years to open. And so if you think of modern European history or even ancient history, you think, well, there's a lot of stuff going on in history, right? But just think in East Texas, for 40 million years, all that happened was this fracture slowly opened. Isn't that much more interesting than the, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire? No, getting a lot of no's in the back there. Um, so, but what that means is that if you compare the actual CL interpretation with the, uh, with the numerical model, what we have here is a bizarre crime. This is the redheaded league, it's sort of red, fast growth rate here, I guess, but it is packed with evidence. It's packed with uh, evidence that we can use to unravel what really happened with these fractures. And then we can use this to figure out whether fractures that we see in outcrop formed in the subsurface, how long it took for them to form, and then therefore why they formed, and consequently, what kind of patterns they had. And so with that, I'm pretty close to wrapping up here. So I showed you that uh, you can go look for the sparkle the next time you take a hike in the, in the uh, flathead because those things are there. And then finally, just two slides. These slides show a picture of some garden variety joints that it's a fractures with no bridging and some veins which have much bridging. And I think even to the untrained eye, you can see that the joints have got a sort of regular spacing and they're all kind of skinny whereas the veins have a wide range of thicknesses and they're all, some of them are kind of clustered together. Well, it turns out that this process that we've been talking about isn't without consequences. There are feedbacks between the precipitation of these cements and actually how the patterns form. And without going into a huge amount of detail, but since Randy Merritt, who invented this kind of analysis is online, I'll show you a picture of a norm, without explaining it, I'll picture you some diagrams of normalized correlation count by Randy Merritt. And the diagrams on the upper side and the lower side here are essentially showing you a very sophisticated way of figuring out the details of how the fracture patterns are arranged over a wide range of scales. These, this example is from the same sandstone, it happens to be a Cretaceous sandstone in the Rockies in, in a gas reservoir in a place where, because of the diagenetic history, it had very little bridging, and the bottom case, a case where it has a lot of bridging. In the case where no bridging, the fractures are an arrangement that's indistinguishable from random. In the deeper subsurface in a gas reservoir, you have hierarchical fractal clustering of fractures due to this bridging phenomenon. So there is a lot more information that can be figured out about how fracture patterns arise that can be useful for predicting fracture patterns from this kind of analysis. So with that, uh, I'm come to a close. I've left 10 minutes for discussion before the hour is up, according to my watch anyway. And so I, what I hope I've showed you underneath the zoom things there, the quartz and the fractures, it can make these fractures bizarre. And that's a good thing. The more complicated things are from a fracture point of view, the better. That's because that's where the information is. And so this is a way of providing evidence for when and why fractures form. And that is the key really to understanding what kind of fracture patterns that we might have there, uh, which will be then therefore useful for predicting fluid flow and heat exchange. And that's really what's needed for making geothermal everywhere in the United States work. And so with that, I'll leave you with a picture of the field crew uh, on the top of Avalanche Divide. 
a couple of years ago. And uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to get up there and look at some cool geology in the Flathead Sandstone and see it with new eyes. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Repeat the questions from the Zoom. Oh, okay. Sure, I can do that because I don't see the questions on here. From uh, so Mike, Ad uh, Mike Adler is going to take a turn here at some point. And okay, great. Sure. With it, uh, by reading a Zoom question. Yeah, I can repeat those. Sure. So when I was looking at your fracture pattern and the little bridging business, and then you kept looking closer and closer, where did that material come from? Because something right above it is something else. So how, I mean, is it, is it flowing into that area? Yeah. So the question is, in the case of the quartz bridges or quartz in general, have, where did it come from? Where did the, the silica, quartz, the silica dioxide? So how did the head of the silica get there? How did the quartz get to be where it is? And keep feeding into and it. And keep feeding into it. So there are probably a couple of hundred papers trying to answer that question that were written in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, some of them with many, many citations. And I would say that at this point, there's no consensus about that, generally speaking. What Rob Landers, um, I, I think one of the key insights in, in practical petroleum geology in the last many decades was to say, what if we don't need to answer that question to figure out how much quartz is actually there? And so I'm gonna actually try and answer your question, but the, the, in this modeling, it, it just assumes that there's enough silica in solution that, if you, at, that at a given temperature, a certain amount of quartz will accumulate. And the amount of quartz that accumulates is going to depend on the temperature mostly. Um, it will also depend initially on whether the material is growing on a on a fracture phase or not, but the quartz quickly grows into that sort of crystalline shape, and once it gets that crystalline shape, the rate slows down. And that that insight that those crystalline shapes are slow growing surfaces actually goes back to Steno in the 1600s. It's like Steno's law: you're, if you think you're an atom and you've got a fresh surface, you can just put it down anywhere. But if there's a crystal face there, then there are certain specific places you have to fit it in. So that's how the crystallography works there. But the, your question is, well, where does the silica come from? Most uh, fluids in the subsurface that are pretty hot, 70, 80 degrees C or higher, have a fair amount of silica in solution. Um, but that actually doesn't really explain the answer. Some people would say, well, you need three or four Mediterranean oceans to account for how much quartz you have there. And by certain calculations, that's true. So the, the answer to your question is still a matter of debate. Um, some of the silica comes from the dissolution of, of other minerals, uh, dissolution of feldspar, dissolution of clay minerals, dissolution of clay minerals in nearby um, or clay rich rocks. And that's what releases the silica into the solution. How it gets from where it gets released to the rock, sometimes it might be convection, sometimes it might be fluid flow like in a hydrothermal system. Some fault rocks have copious amounts of quartz in them. They probably have a sort of an active system. And this kind of analysis wouldn't work there. Although all the faults I've looked at so far are actually pretty well explained by this system. So I think, there, oh, no, hang on. I think he had his hand. I think I've got a couple of questions on maybe the last one. Yeah. This is a follow-up on that one. Oh, okay. What, so she wants to ask the follow-up. So let me I, I would apologize. I thought I always thought that the source of the quartz is nearby pressure dissolution at a boundary of two quartz crystals. Right. There. You, and you showed some in your earlier right. diagrams where you've got quartz crystals that are in pressure dissolution very close by. Right. Yeah, so the, the, the point that was made is that they, that it's a, it's classically understood that the source of the silica in solution is by 
uh, chemical uh, dissolution, chem chemical dissolution on quartz grain contacts. And that goes back to healed probably from the 1950s, at least some of those insights. And that is, you know, still generally part of the process. There are uh, many papers have shown that the mass balance doesn't work out, that you can't get enough quartz from those kinds of point contacts to make the quartz that's nearby. Some of these sandstones have a lot of uh, interpenetration associated with them. Some of them have got pristine point counts and have no evidence of dissolution at all. And Rob Lander's got a great picture though of a mica flake that has speared its way through a quartz grain like a, like, you know, in like a Achilles threw it there, you know? So there's obviously some pretty potent chemical dissolution going on in these rocks. So I'm not trying to, to uh, disparage the idea that there isn't a lot of chemical dissolution going on. And that is really where the, but whether it's the grain contracts right here or the stylite that's two feet away or the shale that's a couple of tens of meters away or whether it's coming in laterally, um, you know, that it, it's probably on a case by case basis. You've got a lot of quartz spicules or something then you can have a lot of local sourcing like that. But, you know, I, I think if we had to figure out in every case where the quartz was coming from, we'd have a hard time doing this. So in the in the case of these quartz bridges and also in what Rob and Linda do for a business, which is predicting quartz accumulation with incredible fidelity, their, um, their modeling technique uh, is really based on understanding the, the things like grain size and thermal history. Okay. Sorry, I... Yeah, I got two questions. I'll just ask one and then if I'm later on. Sure. A second. I go, drive over to Tupon Pass quite frequently and drive by that beautiful outcrop uh, at Gory Bowl. And uh, a lot of the rocks, uh, because of the fracture pattern, have uh, come off of the lift and they're in the borrow pit. Yeah. It's a perfect rom rhombohedrons. Exactly. And, and they're uh, so beautiful that I've collected some. They're great for masonry and stone walls, whatever. But I do notice in them there are dendrite patterns uh, along the fracture lines that don't necessarily follow fracture lines, but they just kind of spread out and make beautiful patterns. I've been told maybe those are is magnesium working into the fracture zones. Yeah. Start, whereas the rock is very light and sandstone. Right. So the, the flat head right here. Yeah. Okay, I see that. Um, so the comment for those online, the comment is that at Teton Pass, uh, uh, at the bottom of the glory slide, the glory bowl there, you can see that those fractures are in a kind of an orthogonal uh, pattern and they make nice sort of rectangular or squarish bricks of, and they break out in those two fracture orientations. And that on the surfaces of some fractures, you see these dark dendritic uh, patterns that look like, um, sometimes they look like plants or you know, roots or something going along the fractures. And the question was, are those some kind of iron or magnesium oxide stains? And the answer to that is yes. The, the um, pyrolusites, salomelane, magnesium oxides, some iron oxides commonly have a growth habit like that and make those dendritic patterns. I um, guess uh, that a lot of that probably has to do with uh, more recent groundwater hydrology. Um, the, the other question that's buried in your, your question is, well, of course, at, at Sheep Steps and at Roaring Creek and at Kit Lake, you really just showed one, you know, to me, you just showed one orientation of fractures, a simple pattern. Whereas at, uh, at Teton Pass, you've got these two patterns. So if you were trying to make uh, bricks for your garden, from sheep stems, which I don't recommend unless you get a sampling permit from the National Park Service and the enough gardening would qualify you for that. But you would get these beautiful elongate uh, bricks. I mean, they're more like, almost like uh, pieces of wood, like you'd put in your fireplace. So they're not all squarish like they are in Teton Pass. And that's because at most of those outcrops, you really have one predominant fracture set, whereas at Teton Pass, there are two sets that are almost equally well-developed. And that's probably because just 
below the road and down into the valley there where the old highway is, there's a big thrust fault. And so you're near another structural feature there. And that may be why those fracture patterns are there, but um, Stephanie Forstner is the PhD student working on the fracture pattern in the range. She hasn't worked that out yet. And so you'll have to dial back when she figures out why the different fracture patterns are where they are. She hasn't gotten that far at this point. From my non-geologic background, I always heard that uh, fractures were caused by temperature uh, fluctuation in precipitation. Um, and I wonder why your taxonomy doesn't include those. Yeah, so the question was uh, that you may have heard that uh, temperature fluctuations or various things like that can cause fractures. And so why didn't I include that? And I, I said at the beginning, I glossed over a lot of things. And one of the first things we try to do with our outcrops, since we're interested just in the fractures that form in the deep subsurface, they're kind of like, the ones we see in outcrop are kind of like fossils. They're kind of like dinosaur bones or something. They're, they formed at different conditions than they're under now. So these, if you notice the scales on the quartz cement, these things are mostly quartz, begins to accumulate rapidly at about 90 degrees centigrade and higher. And so a lot of these fractures were growing at 130, 140, 150 degrees centigrade. And that's the fractures we're interested in because we're interested in fractures that exist in the subsurface. And I mentioned briefly at the beginning of the talk that there are all these other processes that can make fractures. And so I didn't want to, and one of the, the one you mentioned is certainly one of them. You can have temp, you can, you know, you can heat up a rock and throw it into an ice bath and crack it. Uh, you, can, you can have fractures at the top of Mount Moran, some of which may have formed much earlier, that have water seep into them. And then the water freezes and expands and it cracks it. So if you go to Table Mountain where there's nice flathead sandstone exposures or top of Mount Moran, those places you'll see these jumbled boulder fields where the rocks are still almost in the right position, but they've been rotated and tilted and everything due to a combination of this um, expansion of the ice and cracking and thermal heave processes and things like that. So uh, there's a famous paper, Engelder 1985, and it's basically all the different ways that you can get fractures in rocks. And there's just this myriad ways. And the trouble is that they, you know, it's like, okay, you know, so how, how come it's not thermoelastic contraction. If these rocks were at four kilometers depth and now they're at the surface, then you've done something to them and you can make fractures. So if you look in typical structural geology textbook, that's the explanation you'll see. You know, you have rocks at depth, you bring them to the surface, you unload it, fractures. I worked with a guy in, uh, at the New Mexico survey many years ago, and he was convinced that every fracture he saw was related to being next to stream valleys and that they were always next to the stream valleys, which is something that actually happens a lot, right? And so, but he carried it a little too far. It's like the stream is going like this and the fractures are going all over the place. It's like, not all of these are parallel stream valley. So, you know, there, so, you know, I tried to preface the talk without going into a lot of detail about it, but there, that is what you're talking about here really touches on a very fundamental problem that, You've got a lot of ways to make these fractures. If you want to make any progress understanding them, you need to somehow separate them out and say, well, this guy's not due to frost heave because I have, you know, 20 million years history of 140 and 160 degree fluid inclusions in here trapped in these quartz deposits. And so that's the condition these fractures formed under. So it's finding that evidence, which as I showed you is very subtle when you look at the outcrop. You need a powerful microscope to see these features. Although you can see evidence of them with your naked eye. I think you got his hand up first. I do have some uh, chat questions. Okay, hang on a second. We have two questions here and then we can go to the chat. You mentioned okay. in the growing on a facet and growing on a fracture and making them bridge. Now, if you look at a fractured quartz at a, at a micro, is it conchoidal fracture, just like we see in a big crystal? Like, what's the difference between the surface? Okay. The, very small. Yeah, so the, the question is, 
um, I, I mentioned the difference between growing on a on a fractured surface versus on a faceted surface. And the question is, you know, what really is the difference that's going on here? And I think your your question also mentioned the fact that quartz is known to have a kind of a conchoidal fracture. If you go to a rock shop and pick up an expensive specimen and drop it, it's going to break and not in a very systematic way. So quartz actually has a weak basal parting perpendicular to those crystal axes. It's not actually directly perpendicular to it, but usually doesn't, it usually is more irregular fracture than that. So what you have in an aggregate of um, an aggregate like a sandstone, a bunch of sand grains, is that each grain has got a little quartz z-axis built into it. You know, each sand grain is actually usually a uniform little piece of crystal that came from some igneous or metamorphic rocks and where it got tumbled down to a very small size. And so even though it's round and it's got a roundish grain boundary around it, inside of it it has a crystal structure of quartz. And somewhere in there, there's a quartz C-axis, which is the direction that quartz tends to grow in elongate direction. If you just pile up a bunch of quartz crystals in random orientation and then cut a big fracture through it, then the walls of the fractures will have those crystallographic orientations sticking out, so to speak, in different orientations on there. But the surface will just be a planar surface. And so, it won't necessarily be conchoidal. If you were just to break the grain itself, it might break conchoidally, but if you break it with a large fracture cutting through it, it might just be like you sliced it with a knife randomly through the, the crystal. And so the, the difference really is between quartz growing on a, on a surface that's not um, an organized crystallographic set of planes, but just, growing on a random surface in the quartz crystal versus once the crystal develops, the crystallographically defined facets of a crystal. And so it, that initial growth doesn't have to be a, necessarily have to be on a fracture. It could just be on the quartz grain surface. Why is it faster? Why is it faster? <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's it's the... Um, so it, it, you can show that it's faster experimentally. And Rob Lander and Linda Bunnell did an experiment where they took a great big quartz crystal and sliced it and then put a copper sheet on the top of it with holes cut in it and put it into a bomb, you know, a thermal bomb, circulated silica-rich fluid through it, and then took the thing out every, every couple of hours to see how much quartz had grown. And they showed that as the you know, initially you've just got this quartz crystal with a sheet of copper on top of it with holes of different sizes in it. And everything grows really fast at first, but the, for the little holes, eventually the, the facets appear because the, you know, you grow out, you grow up to the size where you have these facets and then the size, then the rate of accumulation of those crystals drops off by about 60 times versus the other. And so the explanation for that in super simple, I have in my chemistry, professional chemist daughter in the audience and cringing at this, but you know the, the, the simple crystal chemistry, the super simple crystal chemistry of this is basically have a, a surface that's a disorganized surface where you can put the silica dioxide atoms down anywhere you want on the surface. But once you build up and, but you're trying to build into it the crystallographically oriented pattern. And once you add enough atoms that you get an organized pattern of crystal faces, then there are only certain places you can put things in. And that's why the rate slows down. And so if you look all the way back at Lander's models of quartz cementation just in the grain packs, you'll notice that initially, even on the grains, you get these little triangular facets that grow fast in the C-axis orientation. And then once they form, the rate slows down. So even in the grain packs with no fractures, you get this two-phase um, accumulation of coarse cement, which is one of the reasons why, if you're just looking at, say, sandstone porosity and tight gas sandstone, the grain size makes a big difference of how much porosity you have left. Because the finer grain rocks get the crystal facets sooner, and they preserve that, and the, 
rate overall slows down and you can fill in less pore space. And so you have more porous rock. Sorry, okay. you probably need diagrams to see that or listen to Rob's presentation. There was another- I Do some chat questions. Okay. So do we have some chat questions there? Um, you may have partially answered uh, this one question, which I have from two different people, but uh, one question was, why do the grains grow bridges? Some grains grow bridges and not others. And uh, another question, which I think is essentially related is, why are the fraction uh, fracture quartz bridges discrete in specific places and not entirely filling the fractures? Yeah, so those are really good questions. Did everybody hear those? So, I mean, that's, that is really the surprising thing about these fractures is that they can, in some places, they, the quartz seems incapable of filling the fracture in. In other places, it makes these long, weird bridges that stretch across. And it's, it really is a combination of factors. You have, you have a combination of, I only go back to the graphic that shows this. It's in here. All right, give me everybody. So this, can everybody see this slide? So each fracture has got a, a couple of things going on in it. It's, it's going to be forming at a probably a temperature range and it's going to have a, a, an opening rate and an opening increment size. Well, we can measure the opening increment sizes for these fractures and they're usually very, very tiny, in an order of a few tens of microns at most. The, if you have a very fast opening rate, then you could, compared to an opening rate that's slow in the same rock, you could have one fracture that had no bridges and another one that had a lot of bridges. And depending on how much the fracture opened and what the temperature is and, and how many times it opens, you could get a whole bunch of different patterns and there are great complexity of things in the bridges, which is good, which means you can tell different fracture patterns apart within a pattern. And a lot of these PhD students that are working on this are taking advantage of that. But really the, the factors that are controlling it are very simple. It's just the temperature, the temperature here at which you're growing, which, will get, which gives you a bunch of different rates rates of accumulation for different orientations. So these are the faceted phases, that these prismat pyramidal and prismatic phases. Those are the rates that have to do with when the crystal is faceted, when it looks like a crystal. These things that say non-euhedral, non-euhedral is just a word that means there isn't a faceted phase there. So those would be equivalent to the fracture phases. And what you can see here is for, you know, say 150 degrees, for a pyramidal phase, you accumulate at one micron per million years. But if you go up to a non-euhedral C-axis phase, where's my guy here? Then you're, that's a log scale in there. So it's over 10 times, um, a 10, it's 10 or 20 microns per million years for the same, at the same temperatures. Does that make sense? And so this diagram shows that you can have these C axes in various different orientations. So you would think maybe because in rock shops, you see a lot of quartz crystals are really long and skinny, and you would think the C axis is really what's controlling it, but it actually has a pretty minor effect. Those quartz crystals you're seeing are from very active hydrothermal systems where, where this kind of process for the most part isn't going on or things are happening at really high temperatures. Some of those quartz crystals that you get in rock shops, if you look in the very center of them, they may have a, a thin thread, and that's called Baden quartz, thread quartz. And if you look at those threads very, very carefully, they have the same crack seal structure that these guys have. So in metamorphic regimes, these fractures open up and they have these things like this that are like threads, they're really, really skinny. And then after they form, then the crystals gradually fatten up like that. So there, um, and you can see that a little bit on these, these things. The red part is the part where the 
fractures are cracking in them, the quartz is quickly filling it in. The blue on the edges is a sort of rind-like deposit that's just slowly accumulating on the side. But if you leave this fracture at high temperature for long enough, that blue rind will eventually fill the whole fracture in. So if you look at fractures like this in the Arable sandstone in northwestern Scotland, another scenic place to go look at fractures in, in the same sandstones, you'll see some fractures that look just like this, except the fractures are all completely filled in by these lateral slow-growing quartz accumulations. And that's because those fractures formed at one temperature, and then they got buried very deeply and didn't move anymore, but gradually filled in with quartz at much higher temperature. So and this is a lot to take in. So I'm sorry if I'm maybe blow your mind with these crack seal bridges and everything, but um, I hope is that answer the question on the chat question on online there about how this all happens. Yeah, yes, and but I do have a, a, a question that actually more is the impact of these uh, bridges. Uh, when you look at the economics or the possibility of having geothermal energy, these bridges look like they're problems. Like you want these cracks to be open. So is that uh, is uh, when you look at possibilities of uh, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, opportunities, um, these these bridges form a, become a problem, don't they? So the, do everybody hear the question? So the question is whether the bridges form the problem. So part of the problem uh, is the graphics here. These are two dimensional views. And so if you look at this fracture, you think, okay, it's open, but then it's blocked here. But remember, these are three dimensional features and that, those little uh, green schematic diagrams, I tried to represent that. These are more like pillar shaped features. And so as far as fluid flow is concerned, there's plenty of ways for the fluid to go around the bridges. So the, the bridges per se are not a problem in blocking fractures ne necessarily. And so the, the main interesting thing about the bridges is that they contain a lot of information. So where they occur, you can use the bridges and fluid inclusions in them to figure out something about how the fractures form. But the, in the larger scheme of things, I haven't really even begun to attempt to explain how cements can affect the permeability of fracture systems. And so it's, it's very commonly the case in fracture systems like these that you have a wide size range. One of the guys in the audience here is a really sort of invented the whole art of looking at size ranges of fractures. And so if you have a little fracture, a very narrow fracture, and the same process happens, it'll be completely filled in. And so that fracture might not have any effect on the, per on the permeability of the economics. A great big fracture that may have opened fast may not even have any bridges in it. It may just be sitting there all happy with nothing blocking it at all. And, and so where you are on that spectrum depends on the history of the, the history of when the fractures formed and what their thermal history was. And so in order to understand the economics, for example, of tight gas sandstones and how fractures impact them or geothermal, you have to predict both which fractures are there, how big they are and how they got, and how much of the porosity of the rock is filled there. And so uh, to, just to take this a little bit further into the ether of the specifics of assessment of geothermal reservoirs. If you look at Stephanie's paper, download it and increase her download numbers, you'll see that one of the things that she looks at is in these fracture networks, the fluid flow actually depends on flow through the network normally. So from one fracture to the next. And the reason fractures are important, like that fracture I showed you at the beginning at Snowdrift Lake, is because of the continuity of the porosity. And this is really what the question was, you know, do the bridges interrupt the continuity of porosity? And I, the bridges don't interrupt the continuity of porosity, but the quartz cement can. And so as you get to the ends of specific fractures or where one fracture connects to another, those places, the fractures tend to be narrower. The fra fracture is narrower, the fracture opening size is smaller, and they're more susceptible to being filled in. And so you go from 
for example, a fractured network where everything's all interconnected and you think, great, we can just flow through this and we'll make all our money. And then you add a little bit of quartz cement and most of the fractures are still wide open, but the tips and the connections fill in and suddenly the continuity of the network is lost. And so then you can't just flow through the fracture network. The conventional analysis currently that everybody is using would then say that fracture network has no value because there would be no flow because all of the software for analyzing fluid flow for the most part assumes that the fractures have to be connected. And what I just told you was that the natural process of quartz accumulation disconnects fractures. They're gonna be disconnected. And that's actually what we found and what Stephanie shows in her paper. But all is not lost because there's still porosity in the sandstone. If there's porosity in the sandstone, the flow can go through the fracture, come to the end of the fracture, go through the pore space and into the next fracture and on. And remember what I said for geothermal, what you need is just the right combination. You need to have permeability, but you also have to have not too much permeability because if you have a fast pathway, like one fracture going from one well to the next, then the cold water will come down, it'll go through the fast pathway, um, it will take the heat out of the rock adjacent to the fast pathway, and eventually you'll just be putting cold water down through the fast pathway and up through the system, and the dorms at Cornell will be getting cold water. It'll be a, a real bummer in Cornell in the wintertime, so it won't work. What you need is to have some permeability, but it ha has to be just the right amount. And so these places where the fractures are partly open and partly connected through the matrix may actually be the perfect thing, especially if you have a lot of fractures, for the flow to be just right. And that's what Nina Habel's thesis model, the ones that have the best electricity generation are the ones that are the sort of mama bear or whatever the, the right bear is for the, you know, the just right circulation of the system in there. But you need to measure what the fractures are in each specific locality. And that's what they're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do at Cornell right now. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a, another uh, question which uh, came um, to me. Does, do people who are worried about or uh, thinking about oil shale and fracturing there, do they, is there similar analysis and thinking that go on uh, in, in this area as well? Yes. Um, so the question is, how about oil shales? And um, I'm hesitating now because I'm trying to keep from going on about this. So the, the answer is yes, that in, in, in shales, in carbonate rocks, in sandstones, and even in basement rocks, you have similar phenomena going on. One of the reasons why you have so much quartz, and quartz actually goes back to your question, is that in sandstones, you've got a lot of silica around, and that's generally what precipitates. If you're in a dola stone, you might have dolomite precipitating. Shales are complicated rocks. They have a compositions that range from like carbonates to like, uh, like very fine siltstones that are very silica rich. So depending on where you are on the, the spectrum, you get a, a wide variety of different reactions and different minerals precipitating. Uh, my colleague, Julia Gale, and several uh, half dozen of the rest of us just published a paper in AAPG Bulletin um, just late last year, which describes the formation of quartz bridges in a West Texas uh, oil shale well in one of the, you know, the fairways for fracking in West Texas. And so these things do exist in shales. And I'm going to cut myself off here because there's so much more that could be said. And I, I better not, because I'll be consequenced. All right. You stay very focused on the fractures themselves. But in the thinking of geothermal energy, does it make any difference as to the age of the fractures or? Yeah, so the question for those of you online is the question is, there was a lot of focus on fractures, but does it matter of uh, the age of the fractures, the tectonic setting in which the fractures form, the particular structural history 
and so forth in terms of the, what's important for geothermal. And I would say the answer to that is yes, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that um, first of all, focusing on the fractures is, that's what I do. But as Rob Lander constantly points out to me, this doesn't work unless you both deal with both the fractures and the host rock porosity. And there is a lot of work. The, the company that Rob and Linda run is based in down in Durango. It's called Geocosm. And for you know fifty thousand dollars a year, you can become a member down there, something like that. I don't know what their current rate is, and get their software and predict sandstone. This their approach to predicting sandstone reservoir quality is now uh, used by most of the majors. You know, a lot of applications are like you're drilling through salt into some hot sandstones that are at depth. You know, the depositional environment, the grain size, and you're wondering if you've got a hammer ringer or a really porous rock. And those guys will tell you, and uh, uh, unlike what was happening in the 90s, most of the place where they were, the sandstone digest community would say, yeah, we can tell you exactly what the porosity is. It's somewhere between 2% and 20%. And everybody in the industry said, bullshit. You know, we don't care if that's the range, you know, that's the difference between a dry hole and a producer. And, um, you know, unfortunately that was where the, field was, you know, it was the field of sandstone diagenesis had gotten to the point where people said, well, the best we can do is somewhere between 2% and 20%, and that's not good enough. And when Rob and Linda do their predictions, they are within, I mean, they sometimes get it like right on the nose, they're within half a percent. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful modeling technique. And I have to be careful to warn my students when they put on their resume that they know touchstone modeling, that they actually better know it because they'll probably get a job offer. Just by, this actually happened to me with one of my earlier graduate students. She was going to learn it. She put it on her resume and got a job offer. It's like, well, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, so and the, but just to answer the rest of your question, fractures, like I said, can form by many different causes, and across Laurentia and across the world, you can have many different processes. You could be in a fold, be next to a fault, or you could be out in some regional setting. In the Tetons, we have a, many different kinds of fracture patterns that formed under a wide variety of circumstances. And Stephanie's dissertation is partly unraveling that fracture history. Um, but if you're working on the Potsdam, you need to be interested in what happened in the vicinity of the Potsdam. And one of the things that I find incredibly bizarre and I don't really understand it, maybe a huge coincidence, but if you look at the main fracture sets in the, the, the Flathead, the Potsdam, the Maison, which is a piece of North America, which is down in, in Argentina right now for some unknown reason, and the Arable, which happens to be over in Scotland, but used to be part of North America, the main fracture set all looks like the fractures in the, the main fracture set that you see it at cheap steps, so go figure. I mean, so that there's probably over Laurentia at some point, some plate scale stress field that led to fracture formation. That's the counting for that. So I think we're being- I, you know, I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna cut off the uh, questions now and uh, so we don't get kicked out of the library, but uh, it's the usual drill with the chairs. These chairs go that way, those chairs go the other direction. And uh, I have a small token present for you, Steve. Oh, my goodness. Be careful with that. And can everyone please join me in thanking Dr. Steve Zola. <laughs> and the rocks sitting here are flathead sandstone. I didn't bring them, so I don't, I don't turn me into the National